Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday morning scripture and coffee. Got my coffee. Black, of course. Before we get started, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we're able to get together. We ask that you reveal the things to us that we need to see and hear from your word this morning. Give us wisdom. Help us to retain what we read and what we hear. Help us to have an open mind and an open heart. And help us to see you in all things. Father, I ask that you bless everyone that is watching with me here this morning and joining in on the scripture reading as we go through the book of John. Bless them richly and let them know that you love them and care for them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, we started in uh, John 1. We're going to go through the book of John. We started in John 1. So I'm just going to do a quick recap of John 1 before we move on to John chapter 2. Before I do that, let me just say this. I am in no means by anything am I a biblical scholar. Uh, I have some formal education. Um, I've been a Christian, born again Christian, for over 30 years, since the age of 13. Uh, I've had uh, extensive time of study and research in the Bible. And I believe, as the late Dr. R.J. Sproul says, Everyone is a theologian. You're either a good one or you're a bad one. And it is our responsibility that when we come to know Jesus Christ and accept him into our lives, it's our responsibility to take the step forward and learn and grow and read and study. There's a difference between reading and studying. Okay, and that's what we're going to hopefully learn here through this series. You do not have to be a biblical scholar, have a master's degree or a doctorate of theology to understand God's Word. I know a man with a ninth grade education. I think he knows God's Word more than any most men that I know because he takes the time to study. Excuse me, starting. Get some fuzzies off there. He takes the, st- the time to study and read and ask questions, and learn, and sit under the authority of someone who is teaching like a pastor, or an elder, or a deacon, or someone like that. So, okay, chapter one. What we did in chapter one was what we've, what we've established in chapter one. I should say, what God's word establishes in chapter one is in, in the very first verse of chapter one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It establishes who Jesus Christ is. It sets up, it's like his resume. He didn't just come onto the scene when Mary and Joseph had him in Bethlehem and gave birth to him in Bethlehem, and then 33 years later, 30 years later, he starts his ministry. This sets the resume up for Christ, who he is. It establishes his authority as God, as the Messiah, as the Christ. And then we go through and we see that um, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, and if you remember the story of Mary and Mary's cousin Elizabeth, Mary was pregnant, Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist, Mary was pregnant with Jesus. And when Mary showed up to visit Elizabeth, John the Baptist leapt for joy in Elizabeth's womb. Um, even if, even as, a, as, an, as a child developing baby developing in his mother's womb he knew who the christ was i mean that is just divine so we go in and and jesus we go from jesus uh his authority being established and his credentials being laid out for us to him being basically ordained we are called to to repent and be baptized well if we're called to repent and be baptized why wouldn't christ set that example for us So he set the example, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. We could go off onto baptism and what happens after baptism. Baptism is a public confession of our faith, right? So the Holy Spirit descended on Christ 
like a dove and stayed with him. When we accept Christ, he comes into our life. The Holy Spirit descends upon us like a dove and it stays with us. It never leaves us. No matter what we do in life, trust me. I'll share that sometime again. So he gets pretty much ordained by God through the baptism. Then he starts calling his disciples out. He starts building up his team, so to speak. And he puts together his disciples that are going to start following him. Simon Peter, Peter's brother, Philip and Nathaniel. I mean, he just starts going down and he starts pulling together the, the 12 men who are going to follow him, learn from him, live with him, love him, get to know him, and be ordained by him to take the gospel into all the world. So we, we ended it with him, um, with Nathaniel and Philip. Okay, so now we're going to go into chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles with you, please open them up to the book of John, chapter 2, and we will begin in verse 1. First, take a sip of my coffee in my Cairn University cup. Great school. Cairn University used to be uh, Philadelphia Biblical University. And they changed the name over to Cairn. That is, uh, my brother is the president of that school. That's not why. It's just a good school. He went there, and it was a great school uh, as well. So let's start chapter 2. By the way, I read from the English Standard Version. It's my preferred uh, reading. Um, great reading Bible. If you want to read through the Bible in the years, the Living Bible. I think it's now called the Living Translation because it's easy to read. Um, then there's... Um, there's uh, I'm trying to see if I can find my Bible. I have a Bible. It's a read through the Bible. No chapters, no verses. It's really cool. It's called the Story Bible. Um, then there's NIV, which is very easy to read. The New King James Version, the King James Version. There's all these different versions out there. Listen, you can't go wrong with any of them. I just prefer the, the ESV. So, without further ado, let's get going on here on chapter 2. Um, because this is a fairly uh, quick chapter. Short chapter, in my, my opinion, but that's just my opinion. Alright, John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Hmm. Gee, is that a mother's intuition? Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Um, let's stop right there. I don't want to get into the Jewish rites of purification because what we're doing is we're reading through, and I'm going to give little commentaries. We're not going to dig deep in theology in a lot of this. Sometimes I may break away. If I feel that it is poignant and important to press uh, something in, but most of, most no, always, I'm not going to do it. That's not the point of this uh, show every Sunday. Okay. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish brides of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, "Fill the jars with water," and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, "Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast." So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water did know, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. Now there was a reason for that, um, that they did that, with the good wine first. Because as you drink, if you've ever drunk strong drink, everything lowers the more you more inebriated, let's say, you get. Okay? So you're not going to notice that it's not good wine. You're just going to keep drinking. 
So that was the that was the the thought that this master had. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs in Jesus. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So this is the first documented miracle that Christ had done. Changing the water to wine. Um, if you know the story of Jesus, um, this is pretty much... Uh, everybody should know about the water to wine. If you know about Jesus Christ and his life, you should know about the water to wine. It's the very first miracle that's documented that Christ performed. Performed, yeah. Um, so we'll go into chap or verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away and do not make my father's house a house of trade or a den of thieves, some Bibles translate. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. And that comes from Psalm, uh, I believe it's Psalm 69.9, I believe. Um, yeah, Psalm 69.9 is where it comes from. We... As a society, have pictures of Jesus Christ, and he's, you know, got his hand like this, and he's looking all pretty, and looks like he's got eyeliner and stuff. And he's a God of love, and love, love, love. And here we see Christ goes in, and he clears the temple out. They have taken God's house, and they have made it a business, and he despised it, and he was angry about it. Is anger a good thing? Yes, there is righteous anger. It is one of the emotions God has uh, made in us. He created us with. How you use that anger determines of whether it can become sin or not. Christ did not sin by whipping these people. Literally taking a bullwhip and whipping these people and chasing them out. Uh, he did not want his ha father's house to be like that. Do we see that today in today's church? That it's become like a business? A money-making thing? It's a sad, sad thing. But rejoice because the Lord will deal with those people. And he is coming back to deal with those people. So we see Christ in one instance out of love for his mother and a celebration. He's changing water into wine. In the next instance, he's in his temple and he's chasing people out because they've turned God's house, the temple, into a house of business, which is not what Christ uh, wants his house to be. So let's go to verse 18. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body, verse 21. This was a prophetic thing that Christ was saying, and they did not know it at the time, what he was saying. When therefore he was raised from his dead, the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So the disciples were there, and they heard Christ talking about this and saying this. Hmm, not thinking much of it. But when he was crucified and he was resurrected, they thought of that time, and they go, oh my goodness, he did it. This is great. And they believed in him even more. Verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Christ was there and he was started. He had started his ministry. And I guess you could say he officially started it at the wedding in Cana. And he started working through and he's in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And he's preaching and he's teaching and he's establishing uh, the ministry that he's putting together. 
But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Christ knew that man was evil. That brings us to the end of the chapter of chapter 2. It is a very short chapter, as I said. We're going to get into chapter 3 next week, and it's going to be exciting because the world's most famous verse is in there, John 3.16. But I want to give you a little preview. It's not just John 3.16 that we should memorize. It is all the way down to uh, verse 18. I think we need to continue reading when we, when we quote that, and we don't. But that is a very good verse to quote. Um, so we're seeing the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We saw him established in chapter 1. We saw uh, the first miracle in chapter 2. Him driving the money changers out of God's temple um, in Jerusalem. Um, turning it into a business, and that's not at all. It's supposed to be about God. Our God is a jealous God. He says that. It's to be all about Him. Um, and rightfully so. He created us. He redeemed us. He redeemed us. So it should be all about Him. So the, one of the things I wanted to talk about in the book of John that I did not mention last week when we started was in Matthew and in Luke and all that, we start from when Mary and Joseph when Mary was picked out by God and actually wasn't picked out, it was destined because God knew, um, because Jesus comes from the line of David, King David. Um, and we start from there, his birth, and then all the way up through his ministry. John, it doesn't do that. It starts at the beginning of his ministry. Um, John was, was called the, the Beloved, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, so uh, John takes a different look. Each one of the Gospels takes a different look of Christ. Okay, Matthew looks at it from a Jewish standpoint. Um, Luke was a physician. He very detail-oriented, very good at documenting things. Um, and then you have Mark, and then you have John. And they each have a different, the same, the same thing they talk about, but coming from a different set of eyes. God's Word is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It does not contradict itself. It has been written over thousands of years. It's had over 45 authors, if you want to call them that. Technically, God is the author of His Word. And not once does it contradict itself. Not once. So, we look at that and we understand that faith is what we need to have. Um, we need to have faith in God's Word, and we need to understand that. So, with that said, I'm going to end there, and I thank you all for joining me this week. Next week, we're going to dig into Chapter 3, and I'm excited about it. Um, if you like uh, this uh, video, please hit the Like button. I'm happy to read your comments, so if you want to comment on something, something comment on it. Um, if you'd like me to, I'm going to start this now. If you'd like me to pray for something for you, it'll be between just us. You can send it to my email at john, J-O-H-N, at thebeardedwelshman.com. And I'd be more than happy to pray for you in an area of your life that you need. I'm going to be expanding this um, as far as what I'm going to do um, ministry-wise with this. I'm going to continue on doing what I'm doing with the other stuff. But this seems to be something that a lot of people yearn for, and we're going to establish it. Um, as I said, I've always been a servant of people, and I want to serve you the best I can, and with as much love as I can. So, I thank you again for joining me this week. I pray that you have a good day. It is the Lord's Day to rest for us. We uh, need to take advantage of that. Let's go throughout our day resting, spending time with family, loving one another, and remembering Christ and God on this day, because it is His day. Appreciate you all coming by. God bless everyone, and I will see you next week. Have a great Sunday.